All right. Good evening, everybody. July 3rd, 2024, not 1863, right? 161 years. Welcome, everyone, for Sacred Trust, our third presentation here in the theater. We're honored to have you. My name is Wayne Motts, and I am the President Emeritus and Chief Historian of the Gettysburg Foundation, which means I'm the Chief Bottle Washer here uh, for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. What an honor it is to have one of my oldest friends here to give the presentation here tonight, Mr. Gary Edelman. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Now, I've got some things I'm going to read, then I'm going to go, as Wayne Motts always does, off script, I think, that's here. Let me first say, before I introduce our speaker, if you have a cell phone, please put that cell phone on silent. Please hold your questions till the end of the presentation. Gary will take some questions here. And then he will be out signing the two books that he has at the signing table when he is completed here. And he's got a new book, Gettysburg in 3D, that's an expanded and revised version uh, out there, as well as Devil's Den. If you don't have them, especially after this, you're going to want to pick them up. So we're going to have him answer some questions when he's done, and then we're going to send him out there. But let me tell you a little bit about my uh, my friend. First of all, he is an award-winning author. He is the co-author and editor of 20 books and 50 articles related to the American Civil War. He is the vice president of the Civil War Center for Photography. He's been a licensed battlefield guide for 29 years, since 1995, and he has lectured at hundreds of American Revolution and Civil War sites across the country and has appeared as a speaker in numerous television documentaries. He doesn't need an introduction here, but since I'm his friend, he's going to get one uh, here, here this evening. He is the full-time chief historian at the American Battlefield Trust, of course, one of the folks that we work with, one of our partners at the Gettysburg Foundation and the Gettysburg National Military Park related to preservation and education, not only of the American Civil War, but the War of 1812, Revolutionary War. I don't think anyone is more well known than my friend when it comes to recognition for the American Civil War and other battlefields over the last decade, giving all the great work that he has done for the trust and his team, his full team at the American Battlefield Trust when it comes to 100 million views, ladies and gentlemen, on YouTube, 100 million. I want to think about, I want you to think about that. And I don't think there's anyone in the country today that has brought more awareness to American Civil War preservation and battlefield preservation outside the Civil War and education related to military history than Gary Edelman, the chief historian at the Battlefield Trust. He is simply on the forefront of doing this. His enthusiasm, his knowledge, his passion, uh, if you're around it, it's just infectious. I was with him most of the morning filming, and I about keeled over uh, this morning, everybody. And I got a lot of energy. I think most of you know that. Well, Gary's got a lot more than, than I do, and we're just tickled pink to have him here with a great presentation on picturing Gettysburg. Please help welcome my friend and supporter of all things Civil War preservation, Gary Edelman. <laughs> my five minutes, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. Is this thing on? Yes. All right, good. So thank you. First of all, get ready to be disappointed after that very generous introduction, Wayne. <laughs> thank you so much. But we got a lot to cover, so let's get right into it. Uh, I'm so glad to be here today. Now, our goal is picturing Gettysburg. How can we picture this place a little bit more? And that can mean a lot of things. But basically, you know, we have stories, such as the stories left by locals, including Emanuel Bushman. We have maps, you know, for a battle. Maps are pretty important. What's where and who did what where? We use maps. Uh, we, of course, use photos, like, that really help us get in and see what something physically looked like and ask us and ask questions as a result. Of course, we go to the place themselves. That we have the battlefield helps us picture it. Check out that little star up there, because sometimes they secure things from the battle that also help us to picture something in the past a little bit better. And then, of course, you have books and movies that help us picture the past a little bit better. And our goal is to bring all these things together to understand and picture the past a little bit better. So I'm really glad you all came out tonight. I think that you know, you've been a great crowd. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I, I hope you're very well equipped to uh, picture Gettysburg now, so thank you. So. 
Now, I might have a couple more slides ahead here because this is, to me, the way you do it, where, where you take more and more of these things and bring them together, much like Gettysburg is an intersection of roads, understanding or picturing the past to me and people like Wayne and me and other people, this is our job, is to look for those intersections between something that happened, an event, a thing, a map, a photo, a story, and how can we bring it all together to picture things better? And that's what I want to talk about, of course. So let's start with the stories. You know, in the end, a lot of us enter the Civil War or history through our family connections, such as these guys uh, on the left, three different generations of soldiers uh, from the Civil War and on to World War I. Or maybe, you know, younger people get it by being in parades with Civil War veterans and just hearing what they had to say. Stories are passed on that way. Of course, what if you were actually in the Civil War like this guy named Warner, a Connecticut soldier who lost both of his arms at the Battle of Gettysburg on Culp's Hill, um, I'll bet you, and it was to friendly fire, I'll bet you he had something to say to the children that he fathered after losing his arms, an impressive feat in itself. Um, of course, again, what, I mean, there's been on average a book on average written every day about the Civil War since the Civil War. And most of them aren't very good, by the way. But it is one of my favorite two statistics of the Civil War. Every day since the Civil War, 60,000 books, fewer than 60,000 days since the Civil War. But there are some great ones out there that help us. They're, the writing can be so good that we've pictured something. I know you all have a book in mind even when I say it. Of course, we have all these great local stories, in this case from Emanuel Bushman. He told all sorts of stories about the round top, about raccoons, and about the 20-foot snake that might have been called the devil, that you had a capacious mouth that could swallow dogs and babies and everything like that. And of course, uh, it's a little bit ridiculous, snakes like that. But, you know, this is Tim Smith and I. <laughs> I didn't even mean that one as a joke, but, uh, you know, that's an, that's an 11 and a half foot snake skin you know, on that rock behind us at Devil's Den. So they do have 10, 11, a shred of truth in every myth. That's a pretty big snake. But most of the snakes that are at Gettysburg, of course, look about like that. They're a the size of a notebook or a little bit more. Northern black racers, other black snakes, um, rat snakes, and uh, the occasional poisonous snake. But I still, in all my time at Gettysburg, have only seen one and not even that close up. Of course, we have our stories handed down over the years about the famous people of Gettysburg, including the woman on the right here, 20-year-old sweet innocent Jenny Wade here with her sister and another woman um, named Comfort, pretty good name there. We know what happened to her. She's known as the only civilian um, to actually be killed in the battle. You could question that if you'd like. We also have stories you're familiar with some of these people. Here's a guy named Cromwell on the le left, a major uh, with the photo of his young bride um, in a locket around his breast when he's killed in the triangular field at Gettysburg. James Smith at Devil's Den right above him pleading with other soldiers, please don't let them take my guns from me. All in vain, uh, three of the seven guns captured by the Confederates at Gettysburg will be his guns. On the Confederate side, Evander M. Law writing uh, about how the difficulty of the rocks and the terrain increased fourfold the uh, challenges of the advance, um, taking over for John Bell Hood during the battle. Um, imagine that. And of course, George Brannard, he's a color bearer from Texas, waving his flag on top of Devil's Den, um, sort of in the uh, effulgence of glory of, of Texas. These stories are handed down to us. And then we see, you know, we learn of other people, such as this guy named Chase, who fought on Stevens Knoll at Gettysburg, who sustained more than 40 wounds from the explosion of a shell there, and woke up in the dead wagon on the way to his own funeral with a bunch of bodies around him. He later will, of course, become a docent at a cyclorama and hand this out to show people what he sacrificed sacrificed his arm and all sorts of, uh, you know, scars all over his body. But when we, you know, sort of learn about Jenny Wade, this is a well-known story. I don't know, maybe something about seeing her dough tray brings it a little bit closer. Okay, that's the dough tray she was working at. We can't see her working, but we can almost imagine it, even though we have only this one real image of her. And maybe if we take another look at that image, how she's sitting in more full length, maybe going to her grave brings you a little closer to her. And when you get closer to something, that's when you can start to picture it, right? People like the licensed battlefield guides, the rangers, me, Wayne, our goal is to try to just make it seem not so inaccessible. We're trying to drag the past forward so that Hopefully you will say, aha, that's what it was like. 
And it could be for a very small thing, but those aha moments join with others and you can picture the past better. Now, what if you see old pictures of Jenny Wade's house on Baltimore Street? Or what if you see a second picture and then you take that picture and you line it up with the same place today? Oh yeah, I call that sort of time travel, right? You're seeing time passing over a place, suddenly you're closer to it. And then of course, going around the corner and seeing the bullet holes in the door um, that actually one of which crashed through and actually lodged in her back and that's how she'd be killed. And all the other ones that hit the brick and didn't go into the house. Somehow you feel closer to Jenny Wade. And I don't know what y'all do when you get closer to something, man, I want a selfie uh, with Jenny Wade. So you just <laughs> show up there and I, I could picture her a little bit better now, okay? I, I, your result might be less trite than mine, but uh, this is me, so. Um, we have other famous stories, not an upper. This is a battle, of course. I think most of y'all know about Bayard Wilkes, a 19-year-old battery commander out on Barlow's Knoll. And I think you know he was terribly wounded and ended up you know being taken to the rear and sort of uh, you know probably left alone there's some things made up about it but what we do know is maybe the most moving um, correspondence uh, to a newspaper of the entire Civil War when his father uh, made his way through town found out where his son might be and then gazing upon uh, upon that form in front of him wrote who can write the history of a battle whose eyes are immovably fastened on a central figure of transcendingly absorbing interest the dead body of an eldest son crushed by a shell in a position where a battery should never have been sent and abandoned to death in a building where surgeons dared not to stay and for any parents in the room, for anybody else who, who uh, has experienced anything like this or thought about this, just this terrible moment, um, that has to bring you a little bit closer to the battle. It's not always the good stories that do it. Likewise, for another soldier that died at Gettysburg named Isaac Nickel, he's from um, Orange County, New York. Uh, he died uh, down a slope pretty far uh, in Confederate territory. A Southerner went through his belongings and found a Bible and brought it with him. And when he was west, of Gettysburg in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, realized that it was inscribed and he left it with a local family there. That Bible made it home to his parents who were therefore able to also come back, get his body, and now you can actually visit his grave up in Orange County, New York. So um, again, understanding that because we have his picture, maybe we've gotten a little bit closer to picturing what's up with that. Now, of course, because this is Gettysburg, like the Battle of Manassas, you know, it was first or it's last or it's the, the main one. Everybody wrote about it. They wrote afterward, and then they wrote in the decades afterward, and the soldiers themselves not only told what happened, but what might have happened had they not performed their deeds. Gettysburg might have been the greatest disaster of the war. The principal ammunition train would have been lost. The general line of battle would have been doubled up, and a disastrous defeat would have been almost inevitable. And it's up to us to look at accounts like this, stories like this, all of this information we receive, and process it to try to picture the past and decide what might be right or wrong. Um, same with maps, of course. I already talked about maps, and here we have a campaign map, okay? And in one map, you're looking at what mighty armies were doing. At about the time of Gettysburg, they are moving their way down uh, in the Tullahoma campaign, down through Middle Tennessee. Uh, Rosecrans, flushed with victory, moves into Georgia, where they lash out at him. Braxton Bragg lashes out and beats him in the Battle of Chickamauga. That's right, I said Braxton Bragg won. Okay, and he is going to then, the seat of war moves over toward Chattanooga where Orchard Knob, Lookout Mountain, Missionary Ridge happens, and that will set up the Atlanta campaign the following fall. See, you're starting to understand who was where when, and in this case, why. You can not only look at campaign maps, maybe you're going to look at a place like Gettysburg and understand the general movements, which core, which division are moving where on uh, this, these days of the battle. Or you can really zoom in to something I was already talking about. Here's Isaac Nichols' unit. Aha, this is where they fought. They fell back to there. And here come some of the Georgians. Maybe one of these guys actually found his Bible and ended up helping him get it back home. So you can get down to a granular level. And now if we know some of the people in that unit and we know know where they fought on the battlefield. This is the triangular field. Aha, now we get it a little bit more. Let's go a little further with maps. We have a scant number of burial maps. This is the Elliott burial map with hash marks for Confederate graves and plus signs for Union graves, the occasional comma sort of uh, punctuation mark for horses that you might see around here as well. And you start to get an idea of where the fighting was heaviest. If we can believe the map, you get an idea of the number of Confederates uh, buried near where Rose Run and Plum Run meet over there. And you can start to form a picture of the battle that way. 
Other maps can help us as well. We not only know uh, now where, okay, where's the peach orchard, where's the wheat field, but based on these little markings, what was growing in each field and who owned it. You could study Henry Wentz. We talked about him on a video yesterday, or you can see who the owners were. You could understand the claims files they left behind and understand a particular part of the battlefield by what was growing, who lived there, and of course, using the other maps as well. You can use a key and say, there's the worm fence. That's the post and rail fence. There's the grass. There's the rye, there's the Timothy, that's the corn. And the soldiers left these things behind. We advanced through a cornfield. We were near a field of rye. And these things are all helpful in helping to picture it. And these are things we see in our daily lives. You drive around Gettysburg and you see a flowing, moving field of wheat. Suddenly you're picturing something that the soldiers saw. And when you look at then pictures of Gettysburg and you see a post and rail fence here, or you see damaged fences on the Chambersburg Pike, and you see trees here, you could look up the agricultural census and picture exactly and understand exactly what um, the Sheeds family was actually growing in their garden if you wanted to. And because we're looking at the right at the Chambersburg Pike, you can then picture, oh, this is what it looked like. This picture's only two, day, two weeks after the battle. This is what it must have looked like as the Union retreated down that road and down the railroad cut over here, hotly pursued by Confederates trying to get into the town of Gettysburg. Um, here, and again, you see some corn out in the field here. You see the dominant Lutheran Theological Seminary cupola rising above all in the first day's field. And here, in the edge of Reynolds Woods, somewhere probably right off the edge of the frame there, John Reynolds would be shot by a Confederate, not necessarily a sharpshooter or a sniper, but he was shot by a bullet in the back of his neck. And seeing this place can really help us understand it better. Seeing a picture like this, seeing where projectiles, mini balls, shrapnel um, actually damage these trees, I'm not sure if I could have pictured quite what it looked like um, without pictures like this. If I zoom in on at least one of them, I can see some shrapnel inside uh, one of these wounds here. And of course, this is Matthew Brady's assistant posing to be dead, or at least posing to provide the size of what a person would look like compared to these trees. And it's not just the photos. We have drawings. We have a lot of drawings. And they could often get there before the photographers. They didn't have clunky glass plates and complex chemicals. All they needed was a pad and some paper. And Edwin Forbes was supposedly sketching on the battlefield on July 3rd and July 4th. So often their sketches are not only all we have, but sometimes they're the earliest thing we have. And here, now showing the Forbes rock. I think this has become very popular because the Gettysburg National Military Park and the Gettysburg Foundation has cleared Culp's Hill to be more more like its wartime appearance. You can see through it. I saw things starting a couple years ago that I never thought I'd see in my life, seeing, seeing this rock from over there and seeing these rocks at the same time. Of course, these sketches were made very quickly with notes, and then they would improve them and make them into nicer works of art, sometimes embellishing them for sale. And you can see the Confederates coming up. You see them crouching behind the Forbes rock here, and you see the Union position dominated by a particularly large boulder. You can see what they did there. You can line those things up. And when I went out there to line it up, here's those two rocks now. Again, look at this ledge right here. I mean, Forbes was very careful in showing that ledge in his drawing, showing a rock on top that you could still see to this day. Okay, And uh, what you could see is that Forbes projected himself 30 feet up for his perspective because you could see these rocks are a little too close together. Okay, But when you look at photos and look in the shadow of a witness tree that still stands near Sickles headquarters marker here at the Trosso farm, immediately a lot comes to mind. This is a famous fight where some Massachusetts uh, uh, battery men are tr getting penned in, trying to slow down Confederates without success um, for very long. And of course, if you want to capture a battery you, battery, you know what you do. You shoot the horses. Okay, And these horses get penned in here. They're trying to escape with the guns. 80 horses are shot. Um, and when you zoom in, in, you can suddenly see this. You can see the areas, the damage in the wall or near a gate where they're trying to cram some of their guns through to escape. Uh, you could see the abandoned limber um, right over here. When you imagine these horses, horses that are too big to bury. So what did they do? They gathered them together in big heaps and burned them. And as I quote from uh, the expanded Gettysburg in 3D, the fetid fog of foulness that rose from the grotesque pyres cast a pall of putrefaction over the deluge of death at Gettysburg. A little over the top, I know. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> that was intentional. Um, but but it, somehow, a description like that, or knowing that these horses would be gathered by other horses into a big heap and burned, um, 
that'll, that, you remember that, okay? And we've all smelled bad things before and you remember that. And maybe you're gonna be able to picture the plight of this battery a little bit better, especially when you stand right next to this house, near that outbuilding over there and near this, what we call hog tight and cow high fence with stone and with a, a rail on top of it. Again, that's what we're trying to do with this discipline. When you stand on the newly opened little round top, man, I hope you've been up there and I hope you enjoy. Um, you know, for this is a photo taken just two weeks after the battle, less than two weeks, we think. Ziegler's Grove in the distance, the field of Pickett's Charge, with the earliest, best photo of it that we really have in July of 1863. But I'd like to zoom in on this distance right over here because all of a sudden you see the Wheatfield Road right here. Many of you have driven along this here. And man, look at this, okay? All of a sudden we're seeing what wagon tracks are artillery tracks, okay? The, apparently they're even busting through the wall right over here um, to try to get access to or from the Wheatfield Road right there at the base of Munchauer's Knoll over there. Again, named only recently because the park cleared it about two decades ago, okay? So looking at these photos and knowing what happened, we could start to speculate, is this Barnes's battery? Who is this? Is it even a cannon? We don't exactly know. I still, if somebody needs some homework, I've not lined up this rock before, okay? Or this rock, I'm curious. I think the Wheatfield Road has moved. I think the stone wall has moved. So if we find these boulders, we'll know where the Wheatfield Road was during the battle. Lastly, if we look over here, you can also see that it's pretty open at the time. And when we move forward a little bit more, you see that the park, you know, it's just impossible to keep up with all the tree clearing they could use to clear some of these and open up that view. But trust me, I know this is a never ending uh, process to try to make this battlefield to freeze time for 1863 so that we can picture Gettysburg, what this talk is all about. Until about uh, nine years ago or so, I never knew, none of us ever knew that there was a photo taken of the Stock House, then known as the Swan Hotel on South Washington Street. Battlefield guides have been stopping and pointing out the bullet holes in it for decades on end. Little did we know that there was a picture of extensive damage from November of 1863 by an amateur photographer, uh, uh, you know, uh, showing how much this house had actually been damaged. And look, you can go back today and see the repairs on the house, actually. And I'm glad Ron Parrish purchased this this uh, photo there because none of us, Frazzanito, me, none of the people who study this stuff had ever seen it before. But of course, there's something about doing then and now that becomes particularly meaningful, impactful. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but when you go to this spot and you look at this crack in this rock, or you look at the distinctive crack up there, and then you go to this same spot, something is happening there, okay? I don't know if it's four dimensions. I don't know if it's time travel. I don't know, I don't know exactly how to feel, and I've done this a lot, okay? When you're at a place like this, other than that I think I understand it a little bit better when I do it. Um, we have great examples of this at Gettysburg, and thanks to William Frazzanito, who has located these spots, he has helped us picture Gettysburg better by learning where these places are. And most of the ones, most of the 1863 photos were uh, located by him. And that takes a photo of a dead soldier and suddenly assigns something to it. It becomes a historical document, such as this photo here, taken near the pond of Plum Run. The parking area is right off to the left here. Here are two dead Confederate soldiers in the throes of rigor mortis at this point. Just must have been a ghastly scene on a low atmosphere day sort of, a little round top, the slopes of which are in the background there. And you know, you can go and still see this place um, today. You can pick your rock there and look for it and you can see a very similar scene and know where they are, okay? Even worse, and I'm sorry, this is not an upper here. When you take this, the photographer also went, mounted this rock and took a picture of this body over there and it's a close up, okay? And although I'm gonna zoom in here, I'm not doing it to sensationalize it. I'm doing it because this guy was not mortally wounded, okay? This guy was killed. And once we know that he was killed on this spot, suddenly we can figure, okay, we know who fought here. He was almost certainly a member of the second Georgia or the 44th or maybe 48th Alabama. And if you take those units and take the dead and subtract those who died in hospitals and were buried in hospital areas, I've got this guy na narrowed down to about 35 different people. And maybe that's the best we can do for him. But we can also further speculate. Uh, he shot on the right side of his head. Did he take cover behind that? Uh, boulder and did something come in from the right? I don't know this, but these are the questions we can ask as we try to picture an event of the past. 
In a more obscure photo, a cave and a crude shelter apparently erected by a Confederate trying to get some sort of shelter. A dead body in the foreground here with Alexander Gardner's prop gun, the wall of the triangular field. We can go right there in a nondescript area there and see what that looks like now with the scene of the Confederate attack in the distance. Uh, this soldier almost certainly advanced somewhere in your field of view and ended up there um, for Gardner to come upon there. We can take post-war photographs such as this one uh, of a Colonel John Wheeler, the highest ranking uh, man from the state of Indiana to die in the battle. And this uh, rock painting, it's not a carving, disappeared not long after the battle. It's not long after it was painted. It's a painting, but luckily you can go and see that rock so we know where at least somebody thought that this had happened. OK, so this can help us by trying to go back and find these places and picture what happened. We can try to understand Wheeler's plight a little bit more. And this can go for other post-war things. Here is a photo of a storm on Little Round Top taken uh, in 1896. Uh, I've been look I looked for this boulder for a solid 15 to 20 years until one day I found it right near uh, the now redone path out toward the 20th Main over there. And of course, when you find something like this, you celebrate, man. Oh, yeah, here I am. You know, here it is, OK? because now I can understand it better. We can take photos and put them together to picture the past better. Aha, this is on the right and that is on the left. That's the Wheatfield Road. This is August of 1863 and we blew this photo up to 40 feet uh, wide, I believe, in the vestibule, the visitor center, if you want to get a great look at this one, okay? We can do it all over the place. For the first day's field, I showed you part of this already. This is a two-plate panorama showing the town, showing Gettysburg College. You can still see it in the modern uh, after the American Battlefield Trust members helped us purchase Lee's headquarters. I went on the roof of the old Appalachian Brewing Company, took that photo as best I could. After uh, we took that building down, we had a drone and I went up and shot that photo again. And you know, you can see in essentials, the distant hills and whatnot have not changed. We have one even closer to home, right at the base of Little Round Top. Uh, I would say the new trail is somewhere right around there. And here are some rocks near the road that when I show you this, you'll just be able to see. Man, there's a road through there, but it has not changed much at all. So we can see it as it was even without the road. And we know which roads, uh, which rocks were destroyed by the War Department in order to provide access here. Not everybody likes it, but you can add a colorized photo. Ah, maybe that allows us to picture the past a little bit better. And you can zoom into these photos as well. I'll point to something first over here and then over there. Here we have a dead body. This is Alexander Gardner here quickly enough before the dead on the south end of the field field were, uh, could be buried because of all the rocky terrain around here. They did that area last. Moving off to the left, I'm seeing what I think must be fresh graves. And because I was already telling you about this, if you see a fresh grave, you might want to look at the Elliott burial map. Is that one of these soldiers right along the run over there? Uh, it's, it's imprecise in some other areas, but this is the way to create your own intersection uh, of creating various sources together to understand something better. I've been using this photo a lot because it's so incredible because you can zoom into the back and see the Adams County Courthouse, see some of the church spires and whatnot, and you can also see something right over there. Oh yeah, that's the house of the hero of Gettysburg, John Burns. Um, the site is still there, the house is long gone, but of course he's photographed by three different photographers in the summer of 1863. And he was so famous, he made the cover of Harper's Weekly and whatnot, and my friend John Richter showing the incredible detail that you can secure from the these glass plate photographs was able to triumphantly find that he found uh, a fly or two on John Burns, okay? Okay, right over there, okay? And you can see, okay? Look, these are actual flies here, right? Now, I then went, he didn't see this one, I found this one, and then I blew it up, and that's definitely a fly. And my friend John Richter, who made this discovery in the first place, didn't like that, so he took a closer look and found 17 flies on and around. <laughs> John Burns, okay? I know these are flies and not dots because there's another photo of John Burns taken at the same time. You can compare them and see which ones are flies and sometimes see their wings. Now, as much as you might want to attribute this to John Burns' hygiene, what you learn <laughs> is that, you know, about two weeks after the battle, when Matthew Brady came, they said every fence post was black with flies because it takes time for flies to actually, uh, you know, uh, leave their larvae in there and, and a corpse can have something like 400,000 of these things in a horse and then the flies emerge two weeks after the battle and blacken the whole community. So here, by zooming in, we can understand what Gettysburg's like a little bit better. Hold on. That was all one sentence so far. Um, 
And you know, we can zoom into photos for other either practical or fun means. Uh, some of y'all know that I like to focus in on this photo taken at Yorktown with French royalty uh, while there's a siege there. And one of these, they're sitting on a case of Moet de Chandon. And if you look in the background there, I'll point to this guy and I would suggest the best photo bomber of the Civil War. <laughs> Check that out, man. How does that allow us to picture Gettysburg better? No, it doesn't at all, but nonetheless, if you are ever with some celebrities, one time I had the pleasure of being on the set of a series called The Good Lord Bird, and I was there with my friend Steve Zahn, and David Diggs was there, and Ethan Hawke was there, and when I got a picture of them, I had someone with my camera, oh yeah, if, if you look off to the right there, I could channel my inner Yorktown guy. And that's the same thing with the Gettysburg Address. You know, we have four different photographers at least here photographing in November of 1863. You can look at the evergreen gatehouse there that we can still see to this day. You zoom in, you see people literally staged around and listening to the address from the fresh lunettes from the battle, the demi-loon-shaped fortifications on East Cemetery Hill there. Of course, you can go in here and people are very uh, careful to look and scrutinize, looking for familiar people. You can see Edward Everett's tent there. He needed a tent because he could could hold it for two hours, and his speech was two hours, so he needed that tent there for personal use. But in this photo, in this series, people have started to pick out and say, I think I see Lincoln. I think this is Lincoln. I think that's Lincoln. This is simple. He's the dude with the top hat. So you just look at it, and you just find the guy and picture Gettysburg a little better. But we have been able to, along in this case with Ranger Chris Gwynn, and you see me over there, the, <laughs> to try to help people picture the past better, we are now literally stepping into historic photos. Check out our videos at Mass Upon X and the Sunken Road at Fredericksburg, and one launching in just a few days of what I think is the most famous photo perhaps ever recorded at Gettysburg. So check out these videos, um, and I hope it allows you to understand the past a little bit better. We can bring something else in. Most Civil War photos were recorded in 3D, okay? So we can not only see them in 3D, most photos were not only taken in 3D, they were taken as if that's the only way they'd ever be seen. The photographers took them low to the ground, put something in the foreground, middle ground, and background to increase the 3D effect, okay? And then you are going to, uh, you know, in this case for Gettysburg 150, uh, we had a big park program where we could put it in the ground there and extend the same rock and some of the same woods in the background and whatnot. And man, that is four dimensions to me. Again, this blows you away when we're able to do it. And this is what it looks like. Look at that. When you show 3D photos, man, they can't even believe it. And it allows you to see the terrible, including maybe the most gruesome photo ever recorded at Gettysburg, and other things, including the humanity at hospitals at Camp Letterman, just uh, east of Gettysburg, uh, with Gettysburg, some of it in the background there. And even though we know of a lot of Camp Letterman photos, just last year, uh, a collector named Fred Scherfe actually released nine photos, many of which had never been seen by anybody, including this unbelievable photo. I'm gonna zoom in on it because I'd never, not only never seen it before, but I've never seen a strange photo like this, nor a, a, such a young amputee. I mean, these are real kids. When you read books and learn that some of these were mere children, look at this photo. Look at these guys who had been through the Battle of Gettysburg at this age, and what in the world is going on with this guy? This guy's lost his leg, and is this his dad putting his head, like leaning on his head? And, um, and, and the woman doesn't look too happy with that either. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here, but these, again, this is, I have 50 questions about this particular one, and that's how we learn. You start asking questions, you wonder, and in doing so, you start to picture what that day was like, that hot, probably July or August day when this photo was taken. We have other famous photos all around the battlefield, and man, I'll tell you what, I would really like to see further on both sides. Well, don't just rely on this often cut Library of Congress uh, uh, glass plates, because these were often cut to be mounted onto slides that you would put into um, uh, stereo viewers. Uh, go to the Gilder Lehrman and see an uncut print and see a whole lot more of that photo. Uh, not only do we see Matthew Brady and his assistant crouching in the grass, but look, oh my God, it's the McPherson house. People always look at the barn, they see the carriage house, but that's part of the actual McPherson house. Pretty cool. This is what we need to be doing. And when it comes to the photos of the dead, you know, I don't know why on my first trip to Gettysburg, I was, you know, particularly drawn to this photo. Maybe because like many, and this is one of the most famous photos of the Civil War too, he, he looked 
like me at the time. You know, I was uh, 20 years old. Um, I'd read about him. He didn't look bloated or disfigured. He hadn't been mauled by animals. So I was really interested in seeing it. Now, Devil's Den was wooded at the time, so this was actually hard to find in the 80s on my first trip. And I was lost in Devil's Den, sort of didn't know where I was. And I pulled out my journal and started writing as I looked up and saw it. Somewhere in Devil's Den, whoa, I just saw the dead sharpshooter position. I'm trembling. I can't breathe right. My heart is pounding quickly. My mouth is dry. This is amazing. Now, why? Why was I so amazed at seeing a bunch of rocks where somebody had lay? I already knew he was dragged there by photographers. I knew he didn't die there, but why? I still don't know exactly why. But something about the passage of time over that place intrigued me. And I don't know what your entry point is, whether it be a movie or a book or something like this, but this was my thing. And I knew exactly what I was going to do. I didn't give it a second thought. I set up my tripod and laid down in the spot. And you know there is no code of conduct. There are legal things on battlefields, things you can't do. But as far as how reverent you're supposed to be, what is OK? Is this OK? I mean, I don't even know exactly if it is or not. But that's what I was compelled to do. And by the way, I've done this hundreds of times um, over the years. People want me to lay down and take pictures there, and I do that. And likewise, when I saw the picture of Alfred Wad on the rock, I want to not only line it up right there, but there I go on my first trip, same day, right there. And then you know, the next year, I went back to Gettysburg. I don't know what's going on with the hair there. Uh, you know, then you become a battlefield guide and say, people, Gary, pose for me or whatnot. And then you could Photoshop, like Photoshop back then was the dark room. This cost me like $40 to be able to burn and dodge myself into it. Of course, eventually Photoshop would be around and you could put Alfred Wad <laughs> actually onto your face and then you could take an app to Devil's Den now and sit next to Alfred Wad. Uh, that is our Gettysburg AR app, by the way, if you're interested. I mean, this is one of the ways we reach young people. But because so many people are interested in this soldier, that makes people want to identify him. Is he from Texas? Is he from Virginia? Is this the same guy? Is this Georgian the same guy? There's been nothing done to convince you know, the real historical record that we know who he is. For now, he's one of the many unidentified soldiers who fell on a battlefield. And man, do people want to identify these guys more than maybe anyone. First of all, I went into the dark room with them, too. Um, you know, everybody knows those are real Civil War glasses there and a flannel shirt. Sure, the Southerners wore those. But again, we can take this famous photo, go to the Gilder Lehrman, and boom, suddenly see a lot more of Seminary Ridge uh, right there and really see much more of a scene. How far away are the guards? Who are they? People want to know. And that does not stop people from straight up proclaiming. They're always their relatives, by the way. Somebody says, these are my relatives, with no evidence at all um, to do it. In this case, this one got the most traction because the Postal Service got interested in it. And one was known to have been dead. One was known to be in a hospital in Virginia. And these so two of these guys were father and son. I would just ask you to really think, you know, when we picture the past, it's tempting to go down a road of something that isn't correct because it might help us, right? Well, when you go to the old courthouse museum in Vicksburg and you see this, um, you know, just at least ask yourself the question. There's two options, right? You have um, a, a soldier who obviously fires a bullet, OK? And it goes in, and it hits a soldier, goes through his pants, into his privates, out his pants the other side, and then flies across into the house and into the womb of a sweet, innocent virgin um, who was there, and she gets impregnated. Or the other option might be maybe she had sex out of wedlock, OK? So, but, but we have to weigh these things and decide which one might be true, OK? In the case of the snake, too, I mean, in getting people interested, everybody had a reaction to this, right? You can picture the snake. How about this story of Antietam, where the soldiers are about to go into battle to attack the bloody lane? That's a pretty terrible spot. And they said their most trying experience was the bees. Mr. Roulette was a beekeeper, and supposedly a shell came in and destroyed some of the apiaries. Well, you zoom in, Frasnito points out, here's the busted apiaries. Oh, yeah. Now we can picture, we can picture them swarming from here and picture the troops around that house getting absolutely swarmed. Nobody likes to be swarmed by angry bees, of course. But let's use animals to get people more interested. Look at a thick dog like this man. You can almost imagine what he feels like right there, right? And of course, we got all sorts of animals during the Civil War. Some guys are going in yelling like roosters and whatnot. And here, dog and a rooster. I don't even know what's going on there. Um, you know, social media is rife with kitties of the Civil War and today, of course. And you know, here's dog on a limber. How could you not like that? I mean, you know. <laughs> Did somebody put him up there? Is this the artillery's pet? I don't know. But of course, there's one most famous mascot. And what's his name? Old 
old Abe. He's attached to a Wisconsin unit. I think it's the eighth. He's in the Atlanta cyclorama. He went up and flew overhead during battles. And these are the type of stories that are going to help to perpetuate the stories of our history among young people, right? It might not be the same old things. And then the old general came across the road. Yes, everybody in the past talked that way. And they came across the road against the valiant enemy. You know, uh, we need to do different things, I think, to picture the past. And when you look into the valley of death, uh, Matthew Brady, who's visible right down here, actually, looking over toward Devil's Den through the trees and Seminary Ridge. You can zoom in and actually see cattle in the valley of death there, okay? So we got animals galore. And again, because we see those animals, because we smell those animals today, it helps us picture the past a little bit better. Now, when I first started coming here, there, uh, raise your hand if you remember cattle in the valley of death. You'd have to weave around them. They'd, everything they left behind was right there. In my case, they chewed on my Fiero one day. And, uh, <laughs> And by the way, I was very reluctant to show this because, yes, I had a Fiero uh, as seen here on Oak Hill or Oak Ridge in uh, 1991. It was the worst car I ever owned. By It wasn't even fun. It looks fun, and it wasn't. Just a terrible car, by the way. And because you have all those animals, you also have, and it shows up in pictures, actual Civil War dung. Wow, check it out. So... <laughs> But seeing this right here, and that's Matthew Brady and General Burnside there, and you could just imagine what 40,000 animals following an army must have smelled like. Just imagine that. I'm seeing a lot of wrinkled noses as I look around there. And I have for a long time wanted to do this. I haven't yet, but I want to take some big piece of meat. I'm not talking about a steak. I mean a pot roast or something. Let that thing get real gamey or something like that. And I want to stage that thing on a battlefield while I'm doing some sort of aftermath so that people can really understand it to not quite get sick to their stomachs, but really get an idea of what it's like. Because to me, part of this intersection is sight, sound, smell, and everything that brings together to drag the past forward. How many people in this room, if given the chance, would take a bite of a 160-year-old piece, piece of hard tack? Anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> Weirdos, by the way, there's about six of us here. You know, totally, it'll bring us closer to history. And you know, so you might get a little sick. It's flour, water, and salt. What's the worst thing that could happen? There we go. Yeah, there's no worms left. If it lasted this long, I mean, and you know, if I'm going to get kids interested, I'm going to show a photo like this, and I'm going to focus on this creepy hand or glove in the foreground. What is this, cousin it or something like that? You know. <laughs> And this might seem trite, right? Because here we go. We all experienced this 15, 20 years ago. Texting is killing the English language. It's the end of the English language. This is just terrible. Well, look back a little further for some perspective and see what they said when the telegraph came around. Oh, my God. The quality of public discourse shall be eroded with the transmission of irrelevant context-free information. This is 160-plus years ago they were concerned about this. I think showing a glove or some Civil War dung isn't exactly going to undo our democratic republic here, okay? The kids will like these things. They're going to remember a digital dog at Lee's headquarters, probably in the same way that the people in the past, here two boys seen uh, in Atlanta uh, after its fall, that are probably not in essentials all that different from the kids of today. Sure, they had a harder life, but my main lesson of studying the past is how similar we are to the people that came before us, not how different we are. So if we need to show how a bullet went through somebody and this guy would pose every few years for pictures, showing a rod or demonstrating through a mirror that you know, you could weave a line through Bartlett's body, or if you could take someone like Napoleon and his famous pose and watch people copy it, and instead of just calling him Napoleon, call him an influencer, oh my God, suddenly he's more accessible to people today. If we need to take the Gettysburg Cyclorama right above us right here, and you already tricking people when they go into thinking, where does the painting end and where does the diorama begin? And if we need to take that online and add a little bit of extra smoke and label some stuff, okay, if it gets a more interested if it allows you, them, future generations, to better picture the past. And finally, if we can uh, get people into the objects, the stuff of history, touching things. I'm a battlefield guide, and man, every time I talk about rifled artillery, one, two, five people go, and they want to touch the grooves. They want to touch the rifling inside the cannon because they suddenly understand, oh, you know, the grooves aren't twisting that fast. Here they are, and this is my way to tell what type of cannon it was and what kind of service it might perform. Here uh, in the Wheatfield, and one of Gettysburg's more near the Wheatfield, one more obscure monuments to a guy named Fuller in the 64th New York. Um, this friend of mine I met uh, some time ago that might have introduced me tonight and I <laughs> took 
a bloodstained tactical manual belonging to him out to the spot. And uh, that's when Wayne was with the National Civil War Museum. And there you see the testament right here to what happened. I didn't know how to feel. We're on video, and I, I, I kind of giggled. I, did, I didn't know exactly what this was like, because this was new. This was, this was showing. I'd, I'd known about Fuller for a long time, but bringing this back to the spot, something different had happened. And I was able to picture that day in a different way than I had before. Just eight days ago, my friends at the Horse Soldier said that we've got something in the shop, and it belongs to the first officer killed in the 44th New York Regiment. And I said, who? Lucius Larrabee? And boom, this is a guy I've been talking about for more than 10 years. Every time I take people to the Devil's Kitchen, I, I, I tell them about Lucius Larrabee. And here his, is his tactical manual um, at the Devil's Kitchen near where he breathed his last. I don't, I don't know exactly how I feel when I do these things, but it's not... It's not your run-of-the-mill usual stuff. And if you're ever able to put on something that makes you feel more historic, and I have not and will not confirm whether this thing was real, but man, putting on their clothes and walking around in them and doing other things and thinking about them and trying to picture it, things like this help as well. When you see actually, you know, the pieces of a uniform that a soldier coughed up that had been driven into his lung during the battle, that just imagines something like that. When you see the two bullets that met in midair and imagine the volume of fire, of course, in this case, you have to be skeptical too, because in the 1880s or 1890s, a guy went to Gettysburg, came back and said, look what I got, the rarest of the rare, two bullets that met in midair. And a friend said, hold on. And he went in the back and said, I got the same one. Where did you get that? And they found they both bought it at the same Gettysburg store. They went up from Virginia, came to Gettysburg, confronted the guy, broke into his back room, and saw a contraption with two guns and a timer where he was making these things in the back room. <laughs> they busted up his equipment, and I like to think roughed him up a little bit Chicago style. Uh, and then they left. So we got to remain skeptical as we do this. And that goes for if you see in a miniseries that, uh, you know, General Lee never called the enemy the enemy. He always called them those people. Well, I wonder about his official report right after the battle. Enemy, 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 enemy. Page after page of him calling the enemy. You know what he doesn't call them? Those people. I mean, if you go on, things get really out of hand, as a matter of fact, man. Um, with honor. And when you hear that all the glass plates are lost to greenhouses, wonder why, why it is that you see pictures of people like me showing the glass plates of the Civil War, OK? I've been to the room at the Library of Congress. That's the drawer, glass negatives. I've seen the sleeves. I've been with them. This is the dead sharpshooter before he was moved. This is what? The three Confederate prisoners. Sure, some things were lost to greenhouses. Those are the portraits that somebody didn't pick up. It's not Robert E. Lee in Richmond or Grant at Massaponics Church, OK? So in picturing the past, we have to be a little bit skeptical of things like the mini ball pregnancy or otherwise such as when we drive around in our normal day. I mean, how can you prove this? Best food ever? Maybe this is Toronto's best chicken, but are you going to believe the sign? I expected that one to go a little bit better, so <laughs> I think I might need to rethink my approach here. Now, the last thing I talked about, of course, was place. That's where it all comes together, and I've been mentioning it this whole time. And when people, veterans came back in 1904, they could visit 1,680 acres of preserved land. If the veterans were to be able to come back today, 7,500 acres, 8,500, it depends what we're really talking about. And that is, of course, because of the War Department, the National Park Service, local preservation organizations, and, of course, the members of the American Battlefield Trust, uh, who have helped add 1,100 acres to these roles, pick Picturing more of these things. I mean, uh, our, our trust members are very generous. I'll just say that, and I'll keep moving on here. But some of the places we've been able to preserve together, all the land between Barlow's Knoll and the town of Gettysburg, OK? You know, that open field, there was a weak easement on it. Uh, and now it's in the hands of the National Park Service where it belongs. And to come full circle, if you look at this blue star over there, that's where Bayard Wilkeson, that's where the almshouse was. Right in the corner of that field, or just beyond it, is these buildings here that we can now picture, thanks to William H. Tipton, and maybe understand Bayard Wilkeson's terrible story of his father coming upon him a little bit more. How many people remember businesses and houses on the Emmitsburg Road, the last two of which were purchased by the trust and conveyed to the park who tore them down in 2011 or 2012? Now we have the whole second day's battlefield open. And of course, I have to talk about Lee's headquarters where people came together to remove a uh, hotel, putt-putt, mini-golf. I liked the hotel. I stayed there. It was great. But man, is it better now. Licensed battlefield guides use it. The Park Service uses it. Uh, reenactment groups use it as they go along. 
And of course, we can take Lee's headquarters itself and we can actually look at expanded views of them. I, I wish years ago I could see Mary Thompson's garden uh, being maintained by a few helpful volunteers right now and seeing further over to the side. I can't wait to expand more of Gettysburg's photos. Now, to close it out, to show how these things can come together, here's a photo of Devil's Den. I took it in black and white with an iPhone not long ago. You know what the ledge of Devil's Den rocks look like here, right? We know what it looked like in November of 1863. It is just a perfect match. Happily, rocks change very slowly. Once in a while, a piece of Devil's Den falls off, but they change very slowly. Now, in... Um, 1904, a guy named William Houghton came back. He was in the second Georgia, and he complained bitterly to his hometown newspaper about the lack of Confederate monuments, and we need to get this stuff going here. But he talked about the day where he charged through this very area here, right? And he said, above us then, not quite 20 feet, on the edge of the rock stood a line of blue-coated regulars firing straight down at our line, which had become broken and passing over and around the huge boulders. Here fell the gallant Muse and Lieutenant Mays of my company. You go to the records, you see that there's a guy named Muse and a guy named Mays in his company. So this guy is telling the truth, at least as best he knows it. Shot through the top of the head by the almost vertical fire. They were both killed and one was killed by a head wound. The other one is uh, uh, not listed, okay? Muse fell to his left, striking my feet. The Government Avenue passes directly over the spot where they fell and just beyond it is an iron sign that says Devil's Den on it. Okay, and this is very interesting to me because here's a guy who fought in the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863, comes back in 1904 and uses a road put in in 1897 and a sign put in in 1901 to tell us in 2024 what happened in 1863 at these places. Okay, the ultimate intersection, a story, uh, knowing about the roads which sometimes move around the battlefield, when a sign was placed and we can now confirm that that's what happened there and finally, who are these blue-coated regulars on top? Okay, finally, the second Georgia, he's saying they're right here. I always pictured them further out into the rocks, and now I have to deal with that in some tiny way. I've understood what one person said one unit at Gettysburg did, and that has helped me picture the past. That has helped me go onto the burial maps, understand it better, and that, to me, is picturing Gettysburg. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. Ah. Thank you, everybody. Well, for one of the few times in my life, I'm speechless. That's uh, <laughs> all I got to say. Wow, man. <laughs> got um, Ambrose Burton side dung and, and who else? Matthew Brady, right? So that's the two things Wayne answer. asked for. Show well, me some dung and Matthew Brady and, Brady, and I'll right. be happy. And you got it. <laughs> all right, Gary, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. All right. You, you yeah. Give okay. the mic to Steve up at the okay. top. We're going to get, uh, I'm thank told you to beat so you much, out of Gary. Here, so. and we're going to get Gary out to the signing table. For those of you that don't have a copy of Gettysburg 3D or the Devil's Den book, Gary will be out there uh, signing. On behalf of the Gettysburg Foundation and our partners, the Gettysburg National Military Park, we want to thank all of you for coming this evening. And we want to remind you that the Gettysburg National Military Park has a full slate of programs. You can find them in the booklet that has been published that is available here in this building. The Sacred Trust programs we're doing are on one side. The parks programs are on, uh, are on another side. And uh, you can also look at the website if you have a problem finding these. Chris Gwynn, our Chief of Interpretation and Education here. Carol Reardon, the Chairman of our Education Committee. I want to thank both of them for their help and support in planning uh, Sacred Trust. I want to thank the staff of the Gettysburg National Military Park and as well as that of the Gettysburg Foundation for getting everyone's evening in the position that you've seen it here today. Come back and see us and we will continue Sacred Trust on the 6th and 7th. Saturday, uh, July 6th and Sunday, July 7th. We'll have four talks uh, outside in the tent that is located in the front of the building. They are all free. First come First serve, and once again, check the website for the Gettysburg National Military Parks programs 
and for the Gettysburg Foundation. I want you all to have a wonderful evening, and thank you for your support. If you're not a member here, you know what you got to do. Wayne Motz's commercial, you've heard many, many times. Get there and make a difference. Look at these things that Gary has shown you, and it takes folks like you. It takes a village, and we'd love to have your assistance in helping us do that. Thank you, and have a great evening.